I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, I want to, uh, we'll start with a prayer. As always, be asking for prayers uh, while you're thinking about people that need to be added to our prayer list. Um, we've got two uh, that I'll go ahead and mention. Uh, for those of y'all that don't know, Beth and Aislinn Green were in a, a pretty bad car wreck uh, this morning. They both were in the hospital today. They've been released. Uh, they're doing doing well. Doesn't you know? So far, it doesn't look like anything uh, permanent for them. So we're we're thankful uh, that they're okay. And then I saw that uh, Kyle uh, and Casey Wigington had their baby, uh, and it was needing some additional care. But I haven't heard uh, anything else. Does anybody know about? Any more about that? It was still in the NICU at our factory. And, it was. And, and uh, they were uh, still, you know, weaning them off of the, the oxygen. Okay. Any others we need to add before we get started? LA surgery is that for an obstruction that it's it's more of the intestinal stuff they're gonna uh, the little stoma that they had in is going to do the reconnection of the intestine. Okay. I don't understand all of the terms that were in the <coughs> I wouldn't but. either so <laughs> that's the best I can figure out. Any other yeah What was the last name again? McCutcheon. 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 All right, any others? Any? Okay. Uh, if you guys will, uh, bow with me. Our Father in heaven, we... Thank you for allowing us to be here tonight, and Father, we have uh, so much to thank you for, and, and today, Father, we thank you for um, the safety that you granted to Beth and Aislinn Green in their car wreck, and Father, uh, we pray that you will continue to be with them, and that uh, if they have any uh, injuries, they will heal quickly and completely. We also thank you for the arrival of the Wigginton's new baby, Father, uh, and we also ask for that you be with that baby, you, you strengthen that baby's lungs and uh, get it out of the NICU as, as soon as possible, Father. Father, we pray for another child, Ellie Bobo, who's going to be having uh, some surgery tomorrow, and we pray that that surgery will go well and that uh, child will be completely healed, Father. Father, we also give you uh, thanks for the healing that you've granted uh, to Kay Deering. We thank you uh, that the treatments she's had have been successful and that her condition is improving, and we pray uh, for continued healing there, Father. Finally, Father, we pray for Sherry McCutcheon, who's been struggling and has two more weeks of treatment, and we play, pray uh, for full healing there. Father, be with us, and be with us as we teach your class tonight. Please help us to teach accurately, and please help your word uh, to be received well. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's a few chairs over in this side. Welcome, everyone. Glad to see faces back in class this week. Uh, welcome to those that are streaming online. We're glad to have you with us. Appreciate the feedback and the comments. Um, I will say that a common theme of multiple comments has been, oh, you skipped my favorite this, or, you know, I wish we had <laughs> talked about that. So... We're going to take that, that we're not going too slow <laughs> and probably going to slow things down a little. I think we've reached that point in the quarter where we are pretty sure we're not going to get through Matthew. We, we've recognized we failed, <laughs> so we're going to revel in it then. 
So we're just going to take our time and let the class go where it goes, and who knows, we might pick it back up another quarter or something and, and try to finish the second half later. But um, I say that to say don't hold back on comments. Uh, we appreciate and enjoy the feedback, and if we miss something, we're going to start backing up and, and trying to address it because you're probably not the only one who's thinking that. So with that in mind, a quick review of what we've been doing with the Gospel of Matthew. The first few chapters are about the authority of Jesus and his heritage uh, that Matthew is trying to communicate and demonstrate to his primary audience, which is the Jews. We saw John the Baptist come on the scene and baptize Jesus. And all along these chapters and these things, we're seeing a lot of Old Testament reference, a lot of Old Testament prophecy fulfillment. And, and that's a constant theme throughout Matthew, as we've discussed multiple times. We saw Jesus' authority demonstrated through what is he taught in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, then we saw his authority through his deeds and his power uh, through the healing and uh, the casting out of demons. And then last week we spent some time looking into some of the responses of the crowds that Jesus got. A lot of them weren't very positive. A lot of different types of negative responses that led up to the point of just outright rejection. Uh, there was no doubt about that rejection. And we saw some some subtle but clear positive notes uh, at the end of each of those two chapters that, that walk through those examples. Reading for next week, we're going to shoot for covering Matthew 14. Depends on how far we get through 13 today and if uh, there's a lot of questions, comments that we need to cover. So, a bit of a summary or overview for chapter 13 and some things we want to talk about. We're going to make a, a pretty distinct transition here from what we've been seeing. And we're going to shift to parables. It's sort of a, di a different take on Jesus' teaching. There's seven or eight parables, depending upon your definition or how you uh, would consider what's a parable and what you might term some things otherwise. We're going to talk a little more about that. And the bulk of it's about the kingdom. That's the, the bulk of the subject matter that, that he covers in these parables. We're also going to see that within the chapter, Jesus tells the disciples why he was teaching in parables. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But in, in summary, uh, it had to do with the secrets and the, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. And it had to do with fulfillment of a couple of different Old Testament prophecies and they're here for reference. Uh, one of those is in chapter uh, 13 in the early verses, and the other one's in verse 34 and 35. Now, one thing we've been pretty big on is context and perspective. And before we get into individual parables themselves and talking about those, and I'll just say I... I'm going to think most of us have studied the parables multiple times, and they're going to seem fairly familiar with you. So to set the context, help our stimulate thought from a little different perspective, I, I want us to understand a little bit more about uh, parables. And Dave, I know you had some other information and some other potential definitions, but in Greek, it's pretty simple. It's a compound word. Uh, that has uh, a verb and a noun, but it's to throw or lay or place something alongside of something else is a very basic definition. So you would place it alongside something else for what purpose? It, it's to compare the two, right? So intentionally to make you think and compare those two things. And I'm sure we... We've all heard that the common definition growing up and, and throughout our lives, it's parables are thought of as earthly stories with heavenly meanings. And that's a, a reasonable definition, though maybe not 
inclusive enough because not all parables are stories. You may be thinking through your mind of are there parables that, that come to mind that aren't stories because we typically think of them uh, in terms of stories. But you'll see the theme that they all seem to stimulate personal thought. And what have we noticed about Jesus up to this point in our study? How does Jesus answer questions? With questions and with thought-stimulating examples of things. So parables fit right into that same mode that he uses for teaching. A couple of those examples, let's flip over real quick and read Mark 7, 15 through 17. I'll catch that one. If somebody else wants to get Luke 4, 23, just as examples of those that, that aren't the, the typical story that we think of. If somebody gets Luke 4, 23, go ahead and read it as one of the examples. And he said to them, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me, tradition, do yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. Uh, and he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown, but I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over the land, and yet Elijah was sent to none of them. Okay, only to Mark, you. that's good. Back up and read the first well, I kept waiting on the first four, four or five words. words there. The no doubt you will quote this proverb. And then what is it? Tradition, heal yourself. Not much of a story there, right? Now, the version you read does refer to it as a proverb, mm -hmm. but other versions refer to it as a parable uh, rooted in a, a similar word. So, very short. Now, Mark 7, 15 through 17. I'm going to start at 14. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand there's nothing outside a person that going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. So again, this one is referred to as a parable. It's a little, it's more of a proverb sounding statement than a story. So all parables don't fit quite that, that definition that we've grown up thinking. What about the Old Testament? Any parables in the Old Testament? That's one of the key ones, and I actually wanted to read that one. Uh, the vineyard came to mind in Isaiah 5, but if you guys will bear with me, because I think back to the point of why did he teach in parables? To stimulate thought on the end of the receiver, as well as to protect those mysteries for who they were intended for in the beginning for the the 12, and then as they taught the others, those, those mysteries of the kingdom. 2 Samuel 12, verses 1 through 7. And let's think about a parable is usually a simple story that's very relatable that I'm going to lay alongside some spiritual or kingdom-related concept. And... Would we say parables are effective? I think that's a pretty effective means of teaching. And I'm glad Robert mentioned this example. It, it's pretty powerful to me, and I just want to read this and think about being in David's shoes when Nathan is, is playing this story to David. It's pretty effective. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, 
which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. And it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for that guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. Was that an effective parable? It served its purpose. And I may be taking this too far, but think about how we might... I'm going to be careful with my words how we might approach someone in that situation? Wouldn't it be difficult not to come across the way that the Pharisees did to to Jesus and the disciples? I mean, just think about the the potential conflict or confrontation that you're going to draw when you try to make that point to someone. It just struck me how effective, and I haven't thought about it until I studied this lesson how effective that parable was for Nathan uh, to play back to David. Convicted him. I mean, he... Well, what, this is to the class, why do you think it was effective? Because it allowed David to convict himself rather than being told. It was relatable to David. He was a shepherd at one point. Right. I, th- I, think, you're, I think you're both right. And... You know, to Robert's point, Nathan could have gone in and said, you're a sinner, you're an adulterer, and you're a murderer. The type of man David was, what would David, what might David have done? He, he, might, he might have killed him. He might have tried to cover it up more. I don't know. Again, I'm maybe going too far there, but I do think I agree with Robert. It's, it's very, very interesting that, that, you know, that was the approach taken there in the Old Testament. And, then, and we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go through the chapter tonight. Um, it, it's so much more effective when, when I'm, I'm saying it's more effective, but I'm not sure I'm saying this correctly. In any kind of encounter with someone, it's better if they can come to the conclusion than you, than you telling them. And, and I believe when we, when we get down to specifically verse 16 in Matthew uh, uh, chapter 13, uh, in verse 16, he's really getting at the heart of the matter why he's talking uh, in parables. And it's, it's, this thing, it's this same concept, which is they've got the same information you've got and they're making a different conclusion. So, you know, essentially I believe he's saying, so me telling them isn't going to do them any good. They, they've got to get there, you know, on their own. So, yeah, I think you're right. I agree with that. It just hadn't struck me until studying for Matthew how the story of Nathan and David hit home so hard with me. I, I hope it, it uh, carries something with you guys. And Siegfried, did you have... Am I calling you out? You look like you wanted to respond. I... If you don't, well, that's fine. I, I, I always hate the things. <laughs> <laughs> we said we need to slow down, so. Well, one thing, when objectivity, when I was trying to get rid of most of my accent, I still have it. I, sound, I sounded very, my English was very, Folks would tell me how to pronounce things. I said, that's what I'm doing. I couldn't hear it. I finally recorded myself in college. And I played the recording back, reading things when I heard myself objectively for the first time. The voice was distorted. didn't really quite sound like me. For the first time, I could hear objectively. And I said, that's bad. And that's how I was able to get rid of some of the 
problem on a daily basis in prison. I can never tell anybody what they did. I always have to tell them what somebody else did or what I've seen. And then they're so quick to condemn. Wait a minute. Isn't that the same thing you just did? Oh, yeah. And then they finally objectively see how things were bad. Just. I, I think you're right, and I think uh, as we go through, if you remember last chapter, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Last chapter, last week, we talked about what happened. You know, in, in the story, they were saying, look, look, look at what those people are doing. Look at what those people are doing. We're going to see some of the same thing actually in the second parable in this chapter. It's, it's the same thing, and I think, it's, I think that is a concept that is woven throughout this this chapter and again back to what we've even been saying in this class is so much of the time the direct answer is not the answer that needs needs to be given there needs to be some internal struggle on the part of people uh, that you're talking with and I'll even go so far as to say not not even necessarily in a a uh, Christian conversation. I mean, think think about in, in the way you approach all your life, uh, how conversations can go differently if you if you take this absolutely. approach. So it, it's it's absolutely got a spiritual uh, uh, connotation, a spiritual impact, and a spiritual application. But I think it can also apply to our everyday life as well. So we spent quite a few minutes up front with your application point for the night. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's, it may be one of the most important things we learn from this. Now, another point, as you study next time through January, January, where did January come from? Through Matthew. <laughs> Y'all better watch me tonight. <laughs> through Matthew, have that different perspective. Understand the effect of this. So we have application, but as we read the parables, couple of things to, to consider first. I think as we read them, we need to think about what's the core message here? Uh, what's the simple message that he's trying to convey? And then second, we've got to concern ourselves with the context, the circumstance, uh, where this parable is shared with us in Scripture and what's going on then. So first, let's make sure we catch the core message. And then let's put it in context with why that message then. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, that, we're good. I think... Um, Enough of an intro. Yeah, I think where we're, where we're going to get to tonight, I'm, I'm thinking we'll probably get through uh, those first two parables. I would like to go back to the kind of the way we've done this every week. Um, I'd like us to read uh, um, uh, verses. We're going to read through the chapter, but uh, could I get somebody to read... Uh, chapter 13, verses uh, 1 uh, to 9. And this is just the introduction and then the parable of the sower, which I think we're probably all familiar with. Go ahead and read out. On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and was passed by the sea. And a great multitude were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places, where they did not have much earth, and immediately they sprang up, because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were all scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others <laughs> fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Okay, so the parable of the sower, that's one we're all familiar with, correct? Anybody not familiar with that one? I have a pure question for you, and this is, you probably are going to think this is funny. As I prepared for this, I wrote myself a note, and I remember writing myself a note and being really excited about this, and here's what I wrote. It is interesting that the first parable recorded is the parable of the sower. Anybody know why that's interesting? 
I, I have forgotten. <laughs> I had a really good point that I was going to make there, but I have forgotten what that point is. Anybody have any guesses as to why that may be or what that point may have been? Okay. So we're, what? Jesus is sowing the seed. Yeah, I, I th that very well may, may have been it. I was, th I was in the back of my mind, I think that's, that's what it was, is he's literally now... You know, starting these parables, sowing the seed and uh, talking about sowing the seed and what's going to happen when the seed is sowed, and that's that's what he's what he's doing. I'm a uh, that. You're a magician. I'm a real mind reader. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you know, we have also studied when he sent the twelve out. He kind of told them, "Here's what you're going to experience. You're going to yep. run into these type of things." To me, this is kind of a, a follow-on of at least for their benefit of what they're going to see and what they yeah. expect. So um, let me ask you guys a question. How many types of soil were there? And I think I just gave it away by waving my fingers. Four. Okay. How, how many of those were effective? One. So one of you engineers, what's that in a percentage? Huh? Well, it's a math question. Who's 25%, right? So here's where I'm going with that. I remember when, when we were doing, um, when we were doing um, door knocking, right, um, or, or learning how to do it and how, how to do those sorts of things. And I think Brian's grinning. He remembers some of this. Uh, so I, I remember somebody saying, so the best you're ever going to be at evangelism is about 25% response rate, right? And actually, if you look at it, if you look at, uh, we, we had some statistics on door knocking, and it's actually, it's actually much, much smaller than that. Um, and that can be, at times, uh, discouraging, right? Because how do, when we think about evangelism, how do we think about it? What, what do we think about? When I say, um, you know, ev evangelizing somebody or studying with them, what, what goes on in your mind? baptisms, and what else? But how does that happen? Some of y'all have been in a class with me, and you've, you've seen me do the example I'm about to, about to do. Any, anybody got any idea? How, how do you think about it in your mind? All right, I'm going to illustrate how I thought about it. Hi, Robert. You know, I'm a Christian. I want you to be one, too. Come on. We're going to go, and I'm going to take him all the way, and I'm going to put him in the water, right? Is that the way it works? No, it's not. And what do we? What does the parable even tell us there? When we plant seed, right? When if you're a gardener, what do you do? You plant that seed and you water it and you nurture it and you take care of it. But when you're sowing, what are you doing? You're, you're broadcasting. You're throwing it and you're and you're you're moving on. And a few few years ago, uh, in this classroom, we were doing a class and we were talking about that. We did a video that's still out there somewhere, and two people that are in this class uh, were in that video, and that's Bart and Julie Graham. And one of the things I wanted to give you all just a few few seconds tonight, if you if you don't mind, to kind of kind of talk a little bit uh, about how you came to become Christians, how you came to know the truth and kind of contrast it with what I'm saying in our minds, what we think it should be like. Can you, can you do that very fairly quickly for us? So I had a, a good friend in the office next to me that uh, I didn't know one denomination from another, but he was a Church of Christ member, and he always had a Bible on his desk, and he was always willing to ask, answer questions and discuss them, and that was it. And uh, Julie was Catholic at the time, and so there was a lot of study, and it was probably a three-year process from beginning to end. But it, for me, it was that good friend who was just willing to try to answer any question and talk about the Bible. And that was somebody working with you. Correct. Now, Julie? always talk about the things that 
she did and what she went on and it just sounded like a whole lot more fun than where you know I had grown up uh, in a di very different background but very much a similar thing so we would ask a lot of questions and, and we knew uh, in our marriage that we needed uh, you know as Samantha came along that we needed to, to be committed to the same story and to be you know both behind where we were uh, going to teach Samantha. And so we started studying on our own uh, for Lent one year, which is the big preparation time before Easter, uh, and started, you know, reading the New Testament. And between the questions that, that our office mates were able to answer and the questions that Bart had about why <coughs> the church that I went to did these things, you know, it was apparent that because we've always done it wasn't a, wasn't a good enough answer. And when we studied uh, the New Testament, you know, there was a lot of things that um, were taught as doctrine or dogma that were not in the New Testament. And that's kind of where we started. And then, then we started looking at how all of the, how all the Catholic Church came to do the things that they do. And, uh, you know, it was, it was very apparent that those were not inspired people that came up with those rules and regulations. And so we just kind of started yeah. visiting around. Uh, Madison was the second Church of Christ that we went to because we started there because of our office mates' uh, encouragement. And, uh, you know, that was 1996. And that, that process, was it days, months, weeks, years? Years. Yeah. It was years. I was actually baptized in the Baptist Church which really confused them because I didn't go back. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so it was, so, <laughs> so, so here, here's the, the point I wanted to make. It was, it was more than one person. And there was, you know, uh, not to put you all on the spot, but there was commitment and searching by Bart and Julie. Uh, Jeff was in that video as well. I'm not going to ask you to, I, I, had, I had worked out before they were going to talk. I didn't know if you would be here or not, Jeff. Jeff was in, in that video that we did. Again, it was similar. It's, it's, it's more than one person. It's not what we think it is. It is that sewing. It is being that coworker that has a Bible on their desk or that person who has, uh, who's willing to talk about sometimes difficult <coughs> subjects, right? Um, but it's, it's, it's doing that, and then I think also important, and we'll get to this in verse 10, is also being, I got you, uh, also being the type of person that will allow that, to, that process to go on for weeks and years. Because I guarantee you those people that were working with y'all, I mean, I don't know if y'all still have contact with them, but they were probably every day for weeks, months, and years, praying and saying, oh, please, please let them see. Okay, yeah, Craig. So, so it's interesting. I, I grew up on a farm, and so it's interesting <coughs> to me that if we just look at it from a typical perspective, we would look at Bart and Julie and say they were good soil, right? They had those characteristics that made them good soil. But I wonder, in your experience, did you uh, experience from those people any soil preparation? that help cultivate that within you to maybe change where you might have been before that and where you wound up, if you see what I'm saying. I mean, we plow all the time, right? And, and we prep soil to make it good. You know, out, where, out in the Midwest, they have rock pickers, that, that machines that go out and just continually pick up rocks to get rid of that so that the soil is prepped. I'm just curious if you experienced that. I don't know if it was, uh, I, I would consider it prepping, but it was, it was questioning, you know, in a non-threatening way, you know, well, what do you think about this scripture? Or, you know, why do you do that practice? And then that made us, you know, and I, I, I have to admit, sometimes I started to prove them wrong, but, you know, that didn't necessarily uh, work out. But, uh, you know, so I, I think that, that very non-threatening and loving questioning, you know, to, to really make people think. It's kind of like the parables do, you know, you kind of 
kind of have to sit and kind of think about it for a while and, and find in the scriptures, um, you know, where it says that to kind of make your thought process change. And your response was different than me telling you, here's what you, but exactly. you got to do yeah. this. Exactly. If you don't do this, mm -hmm. then that. And I'm not trying to intimidate or be a troll. I'm trying to get the microphone closer to the people that are talking in the audience for our folks online. <laughs> okay, any other, any other comments there? Yes. Right. And I think as we move into verse verse 10, uh, and, and I don't know if, we're, if we read it, I'll read it, but uh, as we get into verse 10, one of the things that, that becomes stark to me, and it's something that I've been, been saying all along, just by context, some of these people that he's talking to, what, what have they seen him do? What, what, did, what did they see? They'd seen people healed. They had seen miracles. So, you know, also, as Robert pointed out, these would have been Jews that he was talking to. What did they have? They had the law and the prophets. And he gets into that, you know, in verse 10 there. Now, what was the difference in those Jews? And if you'll remember back, and I'm specifically going to talk about the 12 here, what's the difference in those Jews he was talking to in the examples we had, if you'll remember, specifically when I was talking about Andrew and John, what was the difference? And I think it goes back to your, your soil example. What was the difference in the Jews he's talking to here and what we saw with Andrew and John? Do you remember a point that I made about Andrew and John? Where were they when Jesus was baptized? They were watching. They were, watching. They were there. So do you remember the, the, the example I said? Where, where, did, they, where did they fish? You remember how far it was? It was about, I think it was about 26 miles mm -hmm. away. So, so what were they doing? They, they were searching. Yeah. They had taken the evidence that was in front of them. They had heard, okay, there's this guy out in the wilderness saying stuff. We're going to go see what he has to say. And so, so they were looking. And I think that's essentially where I'm trying to get to in verses um, 10 and further. Now, interestingly, uh, I, I do think it's interesting in verse 10 it says who came to see him the disciples it didn't say the apostles okay so I don't know if that's you know more than the 12 but it says and the, and the disciples came up to came up and said to him why do you speak to them in parables and Jesus answered them to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven but to them it has not been granted for whoever has, to him more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has, shall be taken away from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because while seeing, they do not see. Back to my point, what had they seen? He had demonstrated power to them. And while hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand. As my point earlier, what did these people have? They had the law and the prophets. They had been taught this stuff. And then he even says, and in their case, the, prophet of, uh, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, you shall keep on listening, but shall not understand. And you shall keep on looking, but shall not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. With, they, with their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise... They might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and return, and I would heal them. And then he finishes by saying to these disciples what? But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see. And I'm going to add it to meditorial here. I don't think he means just see. I think he's saying there were people in that day and time that were looking and the Messiah was there and they were going, 
nope, it's not him. It's not him. And that's what, that's what I think he's meaning there. And it says, uh, people long to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Okay? So it, it's, it's back to the, this sort of where, where I was starting tonight, which was saying they had all the information, they had seen the miracles, you know, all those things. And I, as I read that, what Jesus is saying is, it's not going to do me any good to just stand up and outright say, this is what you need to be doing. This is who I am. And we go full circle back to where, where we started, back to even the way Nathan uh, approached David. So we are not going to get to the second parable. <laughs> <laughs> There's only seven or eight. Okay. Okay. I was going to say, he actually answered the question with kind of a parable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 The, the next parable. Uh, it also sort of gets, like you're saying, gets into some of that too because it's, uh, to give a preview of, of next week, I feel like that parable is he's back at, he's giving them a parable that says, hey, don't, don't be the guy that says, oh, look at, look at what they're doing. Let us, let us go take care of them, you know. Any other comments, yeah, questions? Well, let's, let's cut it off there for our part. And yeah. Any comments or questions or things you'd like to hear more about based on what we covered tonight. I'm sorry. I don't know, but this is what I wondered, right? He's crowd and he's in a boat and he says this and did they, did they like get up and walk over and go, oh, Jesus, you're just telling them riddles. You know, is, is that the way? I mean, I think it kind of has to be that way because then he talks to them a little bit and then he goes into the next parable. So I, I was wondering about that as I prepared for this is, is again, I, I try to make these things as, in my mind, I try to paint the picture of that day. And so I'm like, that, I mean, that, that has to be what they did. They had to stood up after he says this and walk over. And I think about, you know, nowadays, if, if, I, if Robert and I said something strange, I dare say nobody would get up, walk up, and say, y'all, hold on a minute, and us confer a little bit. I mean, that, that's what I'm, that's interesting to me that it happened that way, if that makes any, any sense. Yeah. They've decided what they think about it. They have their all their system set up. And he just said this outright. You guys are all wrong. Yeah. It would just been a big hullabaloo, and it would have been nothing accomplished. They would have been making so much noise. But that carrying it over to us, I'm grateful for my dad, you know, who said, and other people said, read the Bible for yourself. People can stand up and teach things and preach things and. You just can't go in and assume that the person's got it all figured out. And a lot of times we're trying to tell people the answers, and they haven't even asked the question. Yep. And if, you, they, if you listen to their questions, they might actually ask you a question that you didn't even understand that you needed to understand. Anyway, so I, I just think that, and I, I'm going to say this just because I come from the strictest sect, you know, the antis, you know. And I've been, Me too. I've been converted. <laughs> but... Um, but I believe the Holy Spirit still works. That Christ still works. If He comes and lives in us, however that happens mystically, we don't understand it. If the Holy Spirit comes and does things for us, we don't understand. He's a real person, still alive and well. I don't think I should sit down and read my Bible. Sometimes I do, and I'm like, oh, hold up, wait a minute. I've been reading the Bible. And I, and I go back and I ask God to help me to understand this because this is Christ. Is Jesus. These are the words of life, the bread that came down from heaven, the living word of God. I think we still need his help, their help. A so, absolutely. But you're answering or asking a question from me, from me that you know I probably hadn't even thought of, maybe just the very thing I need. 
I don't need to have my yeah. plan all set out so perfectly that I don't listen to the question. And, and I think as as we're we're talking, I also think it's interesting mm -hmm. that even in this context where there's a multitude, right? The fact that they were questioning him also tells us something about how he was teaching, right? It was a dialogue. It wasn't a lecture. Okay. I think that was, if y'all have got kids and you need to go, please do that. As always, we'll be up here willing Thanks to talk after. Uh, but thank y'all.